good evening to all of you on behalf of the school of language literature and culture studies i welcome you all to this emmanuel kant memorial lecture which is to be delivered by professor dr rahul pungalia uh, we, we all know that uh, almost 300 years ago emmanuel kant was born in germany and since uh, uh, his he has been a very significant philosopher for many disciplines including literature uh, we all know that uh, both the departments of philosophy and also of literature are in crisis all over the world philosophy is in very deep kind of crisis and uh, literature department also is running some kind of crisis and at the time of crisis we have to understand uh, how we can make philosophy relevant to literature and literature to philosophy so we wanted uh, rahul to uh speak on immanuel kant he has been uh, pursuing his scholarly interests in western philosophical tradition for quite a long time uh he visited the school of language several times at least i remember three times first on a for a symposium on dalit studies it was in 2010 this symposium helped us design a certificate course in fuller ambedkar studies which is now being run by Dr. Ambedkar Chair and Study Center of our University. Then Rahul visited the department again to speak on Marxism and literature. And a couple of years ago, during the heyday of the Corona pandemic, we uh, asked Rahul to speak on John Keats. So that was the 200th uh, death anniversary of John Keats. So there was an online event. So Rahul uh, spoke on John Keats. that time so this is uh, as i remember the fourth time that rahul is going to contribute to some kind of uh, discourse uh, organized by the school of language literature and culture studies uh, rahul has been a very uh, active public intellectual in maharashtra he lives in pune for a long time he remained associated with the english department of abba saheb garware college pune and he used to run Uh, a group discussion called saukasha which uh, uh, was a very significant cultural event in pune so many young scholars and uh, researchers used to be part of this activity and uh, as i understand uh, hundreds of students could intellectually develop uh, because of this discussion during the 90s and the early part of this century so it was a long time that rahul remained associated with many socio cultural and literary activism and organizations he also is genuinely interested in marxian literary and cultural theory he for his phd he worked on adorno and a few other marxian literary and cultural scholars so that way he has always been in a a significant theorist for us he also is a creative writer and two of his anthologies of poems have been published by two different publishing houses so i welcome rahul uh, uh, to this uh, online event and i request professor dr shailaja wadika who is the head of the department of english uh, at this university to speak a little about uh, the school uh, at the very outset i uh, propose uh, over to you ma'am you can start uh, yes sir uh, at the very outset i welcome the guest of this program rahul pungaliya sir and uh, thank him for his continuous association with the school of language literature and culture studies Uh, the school of language literature and culture studies was established in 2000 with the pg program in english marathi was introduced in 2003 and the foreign languages french and spanish in 2009 the school has providing services as the phd research center for the affiliated colleges which are in the jurisdiction of this university school has the identity as the school of writers 
not only the teachers but the students also contributed to the field of creative writing and criticism and honored with the maharashtra state government award sahitya academy award vishakha award best teacher award etc the school in the the teachers in the school have been working as the members of senate academic council board of studies <coughs> of this university as well as that of the other universities in maharashtra and they perform the administrative responsibilities as the dean associate dean of the faculty of humanities similarly the teachers of english avail themselves of the associateship sponsored by ugc at indian institute of advanced studies shimla the teachers of marathi have been working as the members of language advisory committee government of maharashtra film club book club set net workshops are the best practices run by the students in the school the films in various languages dealing with the issues related to the human life have been screened and discussed marathi bhasha samvardhan pandharwada and marathi bhasha gaurav din are the programs run by the school in tune with the orders of the state government the school students under the supervision of teacher organize various activities such as poets meet wikipedia workshop lectures storytelling book exhibition recitation of poems and passages and others the school organized three international seminars and nearby 50 to 60 state and national level seminars or conferences since its establishment to create the value adding members of the society being the prime objective the student centric activities remain the major concern of all the teachers in the school the students studying marathi english french and spanish work here with the spirit of enlightenment and there lies the success of the teaching and learning process of this school of language literature and culture studies once again i thank rahul pungaliya sir for his continuous association with school of language literature and culture studies and with this i take a leave thank you thank you ma'am uh, may i now request rahul to begin thank you dilip uh, i am really honored uh to have been invited to deliver this uh, kant memorial talk by uh, srtm university uh, languages school of languages uh, professor dilip chavhan is a friend and a comrade of long standing and i would like to acknowledge at this uh, moment that he has always pushed me encouraged me to uh, engage in intellectual uh, public activities uh, by uh, inviting me to wherever he has been teaching and because of his uh, various kind of uh, opportunities that he gave me i have managed to do some little work that i've managed to do so thank you dilip for this kind of encouragement and support uh today we are going to talk about immanuel kant the, the german philosopher of the 18th century uh he is considered to be in a way the epitome of enlightenment philosophy the thinker who systematized and articulated very uh, cogently uh, the enlightenment perspective on life and provided in a way a position uh for which or against which the later philosophies uh have been uh arguing so it is in a way a kind of foundational position that kant provided uh the position which in a way defines the architecture and our structure of life the modernity as it were is inaugurated or uh, described or you know uh, it's is uh, intellectually 
uh, schematized by people like Rousseau and Kant and other Enlightenment philosophers. So, in a way, he is the uh, kind of you know inaugural figure. I mean, many people may go back to Descartes and Leibniz as the originators of intellectual philosophical modernity, but it is in Kant's work that the entire kind of uh, modern perspective on life gets uh, crystallized. So, uh, he is certainly a very important figure. The entire philosophical school called German idealism, which consisted of Fichte, Schilling, Hegel, uh, and many other German thinkers like Jacobi, Haman, and Herder were the interlocutors of Kant. They were in continuous dialogue with Kant throughout their uh, philosophy. And as you know that um, a Marxist school called uh, Frankfurt School of Philosophy, which is a uh, philosophical branch of Western Marxism, also is immensely inspired by the entire uh, debates that were conducted in German idealism. Uh, so, uh, one cannot really overstate the importance of this philosophy. What did Kant do? What I'll do, I mean, the plan of my lectures for today and tomorrow will be like this. Today I'll be talking uh, about Kantian philosophy in general. I'll be elucidating uh, his major concepts and laying kind of, you know, uh, overall um, framework uh, of his thought. And tomorrow I'll be talking about his uh, reflections, thoughts on art and uh, their relation to uh, other human activities. Uh, there will be several repetitions which are necessary in a way because Kant is a very uh, consolidated kind of a thinker. He has created all an architectonic, uh, all a kind of you know very uh, uh, well uh, uh, conceived uh, structure of uh, explanations, philosophical, metaphysical explanations in the times when the man's uh, physical and economic uh, and scientific growth had made philosophy redundant and had marginalized literature. So this is a, in a way philosopher of the era when philosophy is becoming more or less unnecessary for human life. When people have, or human species has come into its own, has become confident, the industrial production has begun, capitalist markets have begun, uh, inventions and discoveries about the nature of the world, the has reached a certain uh, quantum where people feel confident that they can master the universe. And at this time, philosophy, which is no more uh, a source of uh, 
advices about how to live as it has been in the past finds itself in a predicament uh, about what exactly its function going to be so in a way the philosophy or metaphysics is becoming uh, a specialized field which can be uh, done without by most of the people who are technologically scientifically or commercially well equipped to live their lives uh, in uh, in satisfying manner uh, so kant is in a way kind of you know making a last ditch effort to make sense of this entire kind of process uh as a philosopher in a way with him the modern philosophy is also born because he criticizes the earlier theology and metaphysics and introduces several themes which the modern philosophy has to deal with such as what is knowledge what is morality and uh, what is art and what is the function of art the validity of knowledge claims which were questioned by the empiricist tradition which was a uh, an english tradition by david hume especially um has to be uh, addressed and kant tries to give uh, uh, an explanation uh, or tries to assure how knowledge is possible how knowledge can be um, certain uh the split between human consciousness and the extensional reality around that consciousness was first uh made by descartes when he separated the cogito from the body or from the uh world which is uh, which operates in space and time and that is where how the cogito which is not spatial or temporal can understand the events and things which exist in space and time had arisen it was in a way a kind of you know an invitation for skepticism later the empiricist philosophy which relied on uh human experiences as the guarantor of the truth of uh human knowledge was questioned by the scottish philosopher david hume and he said that all that one pursues is a barrage of sense impressions and to make sense of these sense impressions to identify these sense expressions as impressions as belonging to one object and to uh posit the relations between various spatial temporal events relations such as relation of causality which is a fundamental relation that modern science 
uh, banks upon modern science builds itself upon that x is the cause of y and science is basically the discovery of cause effect chains in the world physical world so this causality itself was philosophically untenable according to degree because all that you observe is the existence of or happening of two events and or perhaps the succession of two events but if succession is the criterion to determine that x is the cause of y then all the events which preceded a certain event need to be declared to be the cause of that event and that will lead to absurdity so there is no necessary uh, reason why a particular event when it precedes particular other event is elevated in the position of cause and this was a kind of stupendous challenge that he threw to philosophy and it had to be uh, faced it had to be confronted kant says that hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers and then he wrote his critic post 50s because philosophers mature late and he tried to the name of that book that he wrote answering or taking account of hume's objection hume's skepticism was called critique of pure reason it was a critique of the uh reason which would uh claim that it can know things without reference to the experiences that it gets from reality so it was in a way a kind of book which showed the limitations of the reason itself and yet how within those limitations operation of reason is possible hume had in a way paralyzed reason and kant allowed it uh, a kind of you know a certain leeway a certain area in which it could operate uh and for that he uh enacted what is known as the copernican revolution in human thought in philosophy so what did copernicus do copernicus had made earth start moving around the sun earth which was at the center of the universe suddenly started rapidly rotating and revolving around rotating around itself and revolving around uh the sun and it changed the entire perspective of human being towards the world because the stars and the heavenly objects which seemed to be uh, firmly grounded in their respective heavenly spheres suddenly were observed to be moving and this movement was due to uh earth's wounds movement and this kind of shift in perspective is what copernicus did kant did something exactly opposite of this so instead of uh Uh, instead of the kind of the world uh uh yeah, in, instead of the my mind uh which uh was trying to 
get in tandem with the world around to understand it, trying to locate the world as it was in its own place, in its own time. He made the mind guarantor of the objectivity of the world. So, mind or the knowledge did not have to confirm itself to the outside reality. I mean, that is what the scientific dogma for many uh, people who are uh, rationalists or empiricists or who are scientists, they believe that science gives you objective truth. But this objectivity of truth was challenged by David Hume and Kant tried to reinvigorate this objectivity of knowledge through the subjective means. He said that the certainty of our knowledge lies not in its conformity with the outside world, because outside world, as Hume showed, is almost inaccessible. The guarantee of the truth lies in our perception itself, in our modes of cognition itself, in the way we know. And this was the great Copernican turn that Kant executed. He, in a way, liberated human knowledge from the pressure of mind-independent reality, or what is known as the ready-made world. The world Hume had shown is not ready-made, and you can't know it in itself. Now, logically also, it is very paradoxical to know the truth about the world, about the ready-made world, because it assumes that uh, there is already truth out there, and you uh, kind of, you know, uh, collate your, or you kind of, you know, create a um, copy of that truth, and then in your mind, with your concepts, with your knowledge, with your understanding, and then you compare this truth with the truth out there. But if the truth out there is objective, if it is not mentally constructed, then how it can be compared with the concepts of your own making? So it is impossible. It is impossible to uh, verify the truth of your concepts, because your concepts are your own concepts. And the world out there is independent of you. And that's why you are supposed to uh, trust in that world. But the precise, the very independence of that world itself bars you from knowing it without your mental apparatus. You have to use your mental apparatus to know anything. And once you know it through your mental apparatus, it becomes your knowledge and not the objective world. So all knowledge is essentially subjective. So this is what, now this subjectivity was scary. This subjectivity was something which people wanted to shun. But it was Kant who taught us to believe in that subjectivity and he showed the inevitability of the human construction of all knowledge. All knowledge is theory bound. All knowledge is constructed by human beings. Human reason is an autonomous reason. It creates its own knowledge. Kant, in his, uh, in a way, and that is why Kant is the philosopher of our times, because he uh, was the one who gave the first statement of human subjectivity, first statement of human self, individuality. This individuality was absent in the traditional societies. Only in modern society, human beings have become individuals or subjects. So uh, Kant also assured human beings that though you are a physical being, though you are a person with body, 
mass and weight and person who is bound by the physical natural laws so you are just one object among the system of objects that is present in the world still you are free because animals are not free plants are not free stone is not free the world is not free because it is bound by necessity natural necessity it is only the human being who is free it is only the human being who is solely responsible for his judgments it is only human being who is a free agent he is not determined by the laws of the physical world though as a body human being lives within it so human being is an end in itself his actions his decisions his rationality is an end in itself it is not means so human being is a moral le responsible agent and this is a huge responsibility that he placed on human shoulders and it has to be reminded again and again today when people plead that they are helpless in uh, front of the socio economic and natural uh, structures that they have to follow what their religion caste class nationality their position in society uh determines for them that they are helpless they are not responsible for their actions because they are always playing some role or another and this is where kant's writings on morality or ethics come handy this is where one has to be guided by this great man who said that human beings have to have the goodness or the correctness of their action as an end in itself and not as some purpose that they want to achieve through their acting so all human actions have to be actions which are universally valid which any other person in that position would automatically choose something which is irrespective of your uh, interests so this kind of a disinterested moral free action is what kant insisted upon thirdly kant talked about man's ability to appreciate and create beauty or appreciate and this is what in a way kind of you know i mean in a way understanding the world man can do because man is an intelligent animal and it is only in a way a kind of echoing of the laws that actually operate in the world so knowledge physical knowledge scientific knowledge in a way is not a big deal because it is something that human beings uh, being intelligent being you know uh, complex uh, physiologically and persons possessing you know very complex intellectual apparatus can do i mean it is in a way a kind of you know uh, uh, an activity which is which a very cunning animal is capable of so and in a way it is for mastery over the world but a completely uh, purposeless and useless activity that human beings enjoy in their full freedom from even goodness even from the kind of you know necessity to be compassionate kind truthful uh, just is the activity of enjoying the beauty in nature and the beauty uh, created by human beings in a way all these three spheres are separate in kant and in a way he uh, represents the fragmentation that 
modern man has uh, gone through. The fragmentation between uh, three spheres of activity, the natural physical sphere, where people know the world uh, scientifically and operate upon it with the help of technology, the moral world, where people deal with each other as uh, less or more moral agents and the aesthetic world. And as Dilip was saying in the beginning of this uh, session, that today arts faculty is in, in a way, is an endangered species. Because the entire kind of, you know, concentration of modern society, entire emphasis of the modern society is on the physical, scientific, technological aspect of man. So man as a moral being and man as an aesthetic being are relegated to the uh, uh, less important kind of spheres of human activity. So this fragmentation that is real, that is what we experience, uh, where art has become a commodity, where morality has become a kind of, you know, uh, a justificatory activity rather than uh, activity which asserts human nobility. So this fragmentation is uh, in a way theorized for the first time by Immanuel Kant. The historical forces such as birth of modern science, technology, capitalism, forces which cannot be resisted are uh, A given kind of you know a kind of you know philosophical explanation by Kant also the birth of humanism and individual as a unit of modern society with political and moral ca capacity to make political and moral decisions so this individuality is uh, kind of you know uh, well understood by uh, Kant in his uh, second critic, critic of practical reason, and the birth of autonomous art, the art which is uh, not in service of religion, or not in service of entertainment, not in service of uh, rich and powerful, but art which can serve as the critic of the society or create its own autonomous sphere where human beings can truly live and for a while within that aesthetic sphere, an unalienated kind of existence. So that uh, artistic freedom is uh, again uh, theorized by Kant. Uh, well, uh, at this point, I would like to uh, read out to you a uh, very important, very famous lines from Kant. And he is talking about the experience that all of us have when we confront the immensity of nature. So when we are looking at the night sky and all the stars and galaxies overhead. Then the feeling that all of us get, that we are part of this huge, vast universe, and what's our place in it? This existential kind of experience Kant also had, and he ruminated upon it. And it's very interesting what he talked about. He said, and I'm reading him, the first view of a countless multitude of words, the first view of a countless multitude of words annihilates, as it were, my importance as an animal creature. You realize how petty, how small you are, how petty your concerns are. When you look at 
द होल एक्सपांडिंग यूनिवर्स एंड यू लुक एट योर टेम्पोरल प्लेस इन इट एंड यू रियलाइज दैट यू नो यू हार्डली आर गोइंग टू सर्वाइव फॉर फ्यू डिकेट्स वेर एज द वर्ल्ड इज इनफाइनाइटली huge in the past and is going to extend in to towards infinite so the first view of a countless multitude of worlds annihilates as it were my importance as an animal creature which after it has been for a short time provided with vital force one knows not how must give back to the planet a mere speck in the universe the matter from which it came so you are going to die you are ephemeral there is mortality hanging over your existence so you have to give back to what you've got from this world but the second view of the same but the second view of the same universe say gives you can't says the second on the contrary raises my worth as an intelligence infinitely through my personality in which the moral law reveals to me a life independent of animality and even of the whole sensible world at least so far as this may be inferred from the purposive determination of my existence by this law so you are not just an animal among animals you are not just a matter among matter but you are an end in itself you are a person with purpose you have freedom as and here i'll use kantian term as a noumen let what whatever social darwinists may say let them you know explain human behavior as just a creature trying to survive and let them talk about survival of the fittest because that is what you know all capitalist economics love to justify their uh thoughts with but human being is much more than an animal there is a divide within human being that as a body he is an animal or she is an animal but as a soul as subject as self human being is completely free human being is the one who is the foundation who can be truly spontaneous and who who can kind of you know give laws to the world who can regulate his own understanding of the world and the world itself so it is it is the kind of you know um uh, assertion of human dignity that is what kant did well uh, now i'll be uh uh explaining in little more detail uh what kant is uh, saying but before that just give me a small break because there was a phone call that i have to address just one minute
uh, I'll be going in a way kind of in more details about Kantian theory. Uh, now, the philosophy that Kant is critiquing, Kant is finding the limitations of, is called transcendental idealism. Uh, and he is showing the limits of it as well as showing the possibilities of it. His philosophy is known as transcendental. Now, here, what is the meaning of transcendental? Transcendental is the philosophy or the concepts which make knowledge possible, which make understanding human experience possible. So it is a search for concepts, search for conditions of knowledge. So that is transcending our con present experiences. Because the conditions which determine our understanding of experiences are not within the experiences themselves, but they are operating, as it were, in the background. Now, uh, why does one, why, why does Kant go to this discovery of the conditions of knowledge? Because his philosophy is known as the critical philosophy. And he wants to reflect upon, he wants to verify whether the ideas, the concepts are valid and what are the limitations of the validity. And then he comes up with the notion that our knowledge we can be sure about, but we can never be sure about the fact that this knowledge is really about the world that we live in. I mean, we can, we are trapped in a way within our own consciousness. We are trapped within our own systems of framework of knowledge. We can never escape it. We are trapped within our own subjectivity. And that is why we uh, have no right to talk about the world as it is without human consciousness. So it's like, you know, you can't make statement about a tree. The noise it makes when it falls in the deep forest when nobody's listening to it. Because without human perception, without human knowledge, without human observation, whether the tree fell or it did not fail, whether it made noise while crashing or it did not, are questions left only to speculation. There can be no certain knowledge of it. Our knowledge is our knowledge and it is just a luck, it's just fortunate accident that the world behaves itself when it comes to human beings. That world listens to what obeys the laws that we have created. In a way, perhaps that's the only way we can deal with the world. We can deal with the world only through our own perception. And our perception, by happy chance, dovetails with the world that actually is. Apart from that, apart from our perception, apart from our knowledge, can we make certainties about the world in itself, about things in themselves? Kant says no. So this is, in a way, kind of, you know, giving a price, paying a price for the certainty that we have. And the price is that the world as it really exists in itself is not accessible to us. So, and yet Kant assumes that we can have complete certitude about the fundamental laws of nature because they are not descriptions of how things are in themselves independently of our perceptions and conceptions of them. 
but are the structure that the laws of our own minds listen to this care carefully but are the structures that the laws of our own minds impose upon the way things appear to us and the laws of the mind themselves are not hidden mysteries that can be discovered only by the empirical researches of psychologists or neuroscientists but can readily be discovered by every normal human being competent of elementary arithmetic geometry and logic so though kant is talking about faculties of understanding human cognitive faculties he is not a psychologist or he is not a neuroscientist or he is not a physiologist i mean today we uh, listen with great respect to what neurologists have to say about human brain and from that we try to derive uh, laws about human behavior or human emotional patterns or human intellectual pattern this is a kind of you know a logical fallacy because the knowledge of brain neurological structure is man made is something that we the ourselves create how can the knowledge that we ourselves have created determine our behavior moment we know something we are in a way free of it we are we know that this is a possibility and we can always take some other possibility so uh, yet the biological determinism which is uh, a cultural phenomenon because giving undue kind of you know importance to objective sciences disregarding the fact that they that they they are human constructs is a cultural norm is a cultural fashion and it has to be explained in socio cultural economic terms uh kant is doing something very different what kant is saying is that we impose a kind of order on the world because we understand world not as a chaos though it comes to us as chaos kant says that there are two ways of knowing the world one is the receptive faculty where we see things where we hear things smell things through our sensory uh, uh, inlets and here we are passive beings we just take in the data that is provided by the world so if the temperature rises we feel hot or when we are hot then we say that the temperature rises when we feel the rain drops or water on our body on our skin then we say that it is raining and so on and so forth this is the receptive kind of faculty there another faculty which he says is not passive it's active and he calls it spontaneous now what is this spontaneous faculty the spontaneous faculty is the faculty which gives order to this world which gives the logical kind of you know uh, shape to this world like we know things as single thing like i see a tree i see a human being i see a dog through several uh, experiences but to recognize that it is the same dog it is the same tree it is the same human being it is identical with itself requires my mental operation and this is my own understanding of its my own understanding which contributes to creating identity of that object and all the objects in the world are shaped by my identification of those objects so the notion of one notion of oneness notion of the sameness notion of many are the notions provided by my my own mind the notion of time and space i understand things as happening before and after now the in world itself there is nothing before and after it is through my understanding my understanding is such shaped such 
that I can understand things only as happening now or happening before now or happening after now. Whether time is the property of the world in itself or not, I cannot make statement about it. I cannot make statement which is justifiable. But what I, I can say is that I understand world as a temporal historical kind of a thing. I also understand world in space. Things which are near me, things which are away from me, things which are elsewhere and things which are here. So this division of world in time, space, relation to each other, the causality, the numbers is something provided by human beings. And these are the laws of the mind that Kant is investigating. These are the transcendental conditions of experience. So, we, since we can give these laws to the world, we are not completely bound by it. I mean, of course, we realize that we are bound by it. For example, when we are, you know, we choose to take steps to go downstairs instead of the window, we are very much aware of our weight and mass and the law of gravitation. And that's why we don't jump out of the window to go downstairs, but we climb down the staircase. We realize our materiality a bit too often. Our body never allows us to forget itself. But yet, all of us are not bound by our body because we give the laws of nature. We create the laws of nature. Our laws of nature are own impositions on the appearance of reality. And that's why our choices also need not be just part of the chain of action and reaction. Cause and effect. I mean, like for example, somebody behaves rudely with us, or somebody behaves in a kind of, you know, crass, indecent manner. It is our free choice whether to respond in kind or whether to uh, forgive that person or whether to understand the conditions in which he behaved rudely with us. So our behavior is always in our control. We are not subject to the cause and effect relationship. So this is what Kant asserted. And we can govern ourselves with a moral law which we impose upon ourselves willfully. So this is what kind of, you know, uh, it is 8 o'clock and unfortunately the time is up and I've just begun to kind of, you know, deal with some basic ideas of Kant. We still have one more hour tomorrow where I'll be telling you in more detail about Kant's ideas and I thank you all for listening to me patiently. Thank you all. Dilip, I can hear you. Dilip, I can hear you. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. There are two questions. Uh, one is by Aman Bagade. Shall I read it out to you? Yeah, please. You read? Uh, on the it's basis not... of... Uh... Yeah, read out, please. Yeah. Uh, on the basis of materialistic views about the Kantian era, era, how would you think about Kant's theory of categorical imperative so that kind of say moral behavioral behavior that is likely to be a universal law that can't speaks about 
Okay. I'll answer this question. That there can be a, a, a physicalist description, physicalist explanation about uh, a moral behavior where human beings uh, disown their own agency, disown their own uh, status as free uh, moral agents. But, the, but Kant is making you aware that change is possible. I mean, with the materialist or physicalist theories, change is not possible in human condition. That you cannot dream of a better world. You can, can't dream of revolution. You can't dream of change in social or personal uh, behaviors and structures. Kant affords you that freedom of uh, and gives you that confidence that you can change the world around you and you in a way existentialists later sartre and others took up this theme of human answerability and they took it to the most logical kind of you know extreme uh, where any attempt to disown one's own agency is behavior in false faith. That is what existence is assumed or ex asserted. So physicalism and materialism are not really kind of, you know, uh, are logically inconsistent to begin with, because the theory of physicalism is again a human construct. And how can a human construct be binding upon you, on your own behavior? Because if it is created by you, then obviously, you know, you are, it's just a version. It is just one way of looking at. There can be many other alternative uh, stories that can be told about human behavior. So this is one answer. Okay, what is the next question? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Just a minute. Yeah, Immanuel Kant, rationalists and imperialists. So, in which context we can utilize this process as epistemology? Well, uh, Kantian uh, Kant is, in a way, a kind of you know he uh, created this epistemology or what is epistemology it is explanation of how we know things and uh, before kant there were empiricists especially in great britain and scotland and there were rationalists on the continent such as leibniz descartes leibniz and wolf and these other philosophers Rationalists talked about innate ideas. I mean, they also had their own epistemology and empiricists had their own epistemology. Empiricists said that human mind is tabula rasa or a kind of vacant slate on which sensory impressions leave traces. And this is how we understand. This is how we connect with the world. Whereas rationalists said that, you know, all our knowledge is innate. It comes from within kind of. You know. And they were basically mathematically oriented because, you, as you know, that mathematical knowledge is not really dependent upon the world outside. It is dependent upon the logical relation among numbers, shapes, and sizes, and lines. So this kind of, you know, rationalist mathematical model of human mind, human cognition, and empirist model. What Kant did is that he tried to merge these two together by talking about the uh, challenge that Hume had thrown, that true human, true knowledge of the world is impossible because all knowledge comes through your, uh, all knowledge comes through your senses in fragmented form. So there is no order out. And if it is your mind which is giving order, 
then how can we say that it is valid to valid that it is applicable to the world outside that is the problem so rationalists are free to say that they have got innate ideas but how do those ideas apply to the world outside is a big question is a moot question and empiricists were made speechless by hume's skepticism because knowledge is uh, impossible according to you so kant what he does is he effects this copernican revolution as that i talked about that he shifts the entire emphasis on human uh, human being himself and he says that the objectivity of the world objectivity of the knowledge is dependent upon human subjective understanding of the world so he turned objectivity into subjectivity and he says that human beings through their senses and because they live in the world they get the knowledge data from things in themselves from the world itself which is otherwise inaccessible but what they do with that the data is the capacities of their own mind and those capacities are spontaneous capacities they are not physiological capacities they are not neurological capacities but they are purely intellectual capacities so he is not talking about neural uh, patterns is talking about the capacities of rationality or the categories without which understanding of the world is impossible such as for example you know categories of difference and sameness without them you cannot understand difference in colors for example when the data the color data is going to be provided by you but naming and identifying a particular color as red and seeing that it is different than blue or green or orange this distinction capacity to distinguish identifying i mean this is this is a human construct and that's why they are so varied in various languages in various cultures the color vocabulary color data are different so this is kantian epistemology in short uh well i i read the question dilip and uh, i'll answer uh, this uh, ms patil's uh, question no individual philosophy there is philosophy is not psychology and that's why they can be individual psychologies but there cannot be individual philosophy this is philosophy of mind or the rational mind philosophy of the mind which tries to understand and this philosophy of mind is common to all human beings okay so each individual has to behave in his or her own freedom still the categories of understanding are common to all of us because we share the common language we share the common world in a way so for example you know before and after cause and effect one and many sameness and difference are categories of language are categories of a mind which are common to all of us good and bad oppressed and free bound and uh, spontaneous all these are categories that we share and we can have reasonable dialogue about them among each other and that means that in a way it is one kind of you know uh, what should we say common subject hood that all of us share it. so there is no not different philosophies for each human being okay it is the same philosophy for all of us um uh, rahul yes yeah what dipti patil perhaps uh, would like to know is uh, how do we understand that uh, that an individual can have his or her own world view 
which can be relatively a distinct world view something that gramsci yes. was trying to hint yeah. at despite yeah. uh, kind of commonality uh, pertaining to ideology and subjectivity yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly Yes, yes, uh, that's a, a very valid point, Dilip. Yes, individuals have their own worldviews, and this is human creativity. This is human spontaneity that individuals can create their own uh, kind of, you know, moral, because each moral choice is going to be unique. You are never going to be in the life situation that I am in. So your life situation, the choices that you make in your life situation cannot be determined either by me or by, say, Lord Rama or by, you know, what a particular uh, religious institution tells you. Every time, each experience that you are going to have is the brand new experience. Every situation that you are in is brand new. And that's where you have to rely on your own worldview as they put it in such nice uh, uh, way so succinctly that it's your own worldview it's your own moral perspective outlook it's your own moral agency which is going to uh, help you in living your own life so yes each individual is free and in that freedom, each individual can construct his own perception. Yes. And without that freedom, goodness and badness have no meaning. If I behave in a correct manner, because law asks me to, then I am not a free human being. Okay. I'm just a law abiding citizen. If I behave in a particular manner, because my religious organization tells me to, then I have given up my dignity as a human being, my nobleness as a human being. I just can't, you know, follow others in, I should not be dominated by others. I have to take my own responsibility for my own action. That is enlightenment. That human beings have to be uh, have to assert their own individuality. And that's why there is nothing, you know, I mean, there are some things which are absolutely wrong, but there's nothing absolutely right here in that sense. You know. Each right has its own place. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Uh, this is going to be a lecture in two parts. So today we had some kind of acquaintance with some of the ideas of Immanuel Kant, but we have to listen to Raul tomorrow again. And I hope uh, he makes us more aware of uh, three critics, pure reason, practical reason, and judgment tomorrow. Uh, as uh, we started with the argument that the departments of philosophy and the departments of English all over the world are in crisis. So this growing instrumentalization of humanities and philosophy in general uh, is something that we need to address. We, ha we have certain political and social compulsions these days, uh, which also need some kind of uh, attention. So can we uh, have some kind of more interactive dialogue tomorrow? Hope that uh, we enjoy tomorrow's session also. So I thank all those who joined this online class. Uh, and hope that you join tomorrow also. So uh, thanks to all and uh, see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Thank you.